Okay, so um, this uh, the conceptual framework of this presentation is mostly from um, uh, difference in repetition, but uh, I can try to translate uh, as we go along into the assembly theorem uh, terminology drawn from the thousand plateaus. It's actually one of the most interesting. Parts of the Lewis scholarship is whether, uh, as Manuel put it uh, in Intensive Science and Virtual Philosophy, whether there's a, a clean enough translation between those various terms uh, from difference in repetition to anti adipose styles and plateaus, or whether the different terminology among those books represents a different ontology. So it's a live question. I'm just going to, for our purposes here, just try to treat them as translatable. So using the difference of repetition terminology, we have uh, intensive, virtual, and actual. I think the translation that would propose is that what we call the plane of consistency populated by abstract machines in the terminology of the thousand plateaus is what difference of repetition calls the virtual. Then the intensity or the intensive processes are what allows for or disallows or what allows for the meshing of assemblages and creation of stacked assemblages or they're falling apart. And so Manuel gave a wonderful presentation about how we talk about that in terms of codes and territories. Right? But uh, and then we have actual products. So from my perspective, I think that the only thing that exists are intensive processes. But the virtual and the actual are limits of those processes. So there's a couple of key terms where, uh, key lines where I'll say that the stratification is the uh, limit process, or strata are limits of the stratification process, or the abstract machine, or the de stratified body is, body without organs, is the limit of the uh, de stratification. So, it's very complicated in terms to how to think this ontology, but I think by the time we get to a uh, thousand plateaus, certainly the emphasis is, although it doesn't use the term, is on this in intensities and how they mesh together. Uh, and then this uh, notion here that we have the, the production process is the integration of differentials. So I'm going to. Uh, all right, so one of our famous uh, um, uh, phrases, which actually does occur, re reoccur, in difference of repetition um, and in uh, a thousand plateaus. So the world is an net. The idea is that you have these bands of intensity or gradients of uh, difference within a field. At particular thresholds, you'll get like a, 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 an actualization or a concretion. So, So if you put it all together, I think Deleuze enables a really wide-ranging uh, ontology. It's naturalist. There's no uh, spiritual dimension. Although, I think it offers an account of what had been expressed in spiritual terms, in material terms, without thereby being reductionist, physicalist, scientific, or anything like that. So it's it's an ongoing project, right? And we have these interlocking scales, physical, biological, and political systems, and multiple spatial scales and multiple temporal scales. So one of the ways I, I like to think about actual or substances is that it's a very slow moving process relative to the human sensorium, the human processing scale, which depends on what was interesting and important to our ancestors. So what was interesting and important to our ancestors? Tigers, <laughs> lions, woolly mammoths. 
So big, relatively you know, fast compared to us, but relatively slow compared to things. But faster though than uh, uh, faster than the uh, flows that are actually chipping away at this table. So we might as well treat rocks as background, right? For the leaping tiger that we want to pay attention to, right? But the rock itself can flow if, by science, we're able to expand the. We can see it flowing by expanding our time scale. And so we've, we've talked about this uh, earlier today then, when we have this uh, relative stabilization, we get the emergent uh, feel of the emergent uh, assemblage, which has certain functions that uh, are not accountable to or are not reducible to the component parts. Right? So it's, we've talked quite a bit about the emergence. So I'm going to go a little quicker here. Using this, uh, we can talk about flows of solar energy. Or, the way in which a wind current, one of my favorite examples, is a way of taking an energy gradient and equalizing it. The right? reason you get air, if there's any air moving here, <laughs> it's from a high density to a low density. So you can do this on a global scale with uh, uh, solar energy. My other great example being uh, from Louisiana is the hurricane. So you have these bands of temperature and pressure difference off the coast of Africa. At particular uh, singularities or threshold points, they'll start forming thunderstorms. To get them moving at the right uh, amount, we'll form a band of thunderstorms. Another uh, um, uh, intensity will start the eye wall, right? And then you moves it across the uh, Atlantic, where then it starts to hit a different uh, regime of temperature and pressure as it if it, by, by bad luck for us, it enters the Gulf of Mexico, where it has a huge pool of thermal energy it can draw on. So I give you, I like these kind of uh, scientific fun facts. So here's a fun fact about Hurricane Katrina. During the summer of 2005, we had a surface temperature of 90 degrees uh, uh, Fahrenheit, which is 34, 35, 36, and that 90 degrees went down 50 meters. But across the Gulf of Mexico. So that's how much thermal energy was waiting for this other thing to pick up and push it towards the end. Right? But prior to the formation of the thunderstorms, the, the uh, thunderstorm cycles, the uh, eye wall, there's no little mini hurricane waiting off the coast of Africa. There are potentials, capacities to laugh at the VFF that can be formed when the, the processes of moving uh, air and water to equalize temperatures hits the right pressure. So that's the, that's the sort of, uh, uh, so you, we can talk about the abstract machine or the virtual pattern of a hurricane does not exist, right, but it insists such that the intensive process, which we call a hurricane, that can exist. And then you can measure it on a point at any uh, time T1 and has a certain uh, coordinate system so then you can actually talk about its extensive properties. So, all right. We see this in neurodynamics as well. I don't want to go, go into it, but uh, we can uh, see that same thing. There's a kind of resting neural uh, firing patterns which don't particularly focus in on any one. Uh, uh, it's one of the newest things that uh, people in neurodynamics are looking at. What happens when you're not focusing on something? What happens when you're daydreaming? Previous generations of neuroscientists uh, had not bothered with that. Right? They only wanted to know what does your brain look like when you're focusing and doing a perceptual life. But now there's a lot of stuff about this you know, resting state. So you see the same thing. There's no little mini uh, 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 perceptual act or, or uh, uh, ordered set of uh, neural firing patterns waiting but there are potentials of capacity. So then I tried to put all this together in my political affect book. Uh, one of the reasons I use Katrina all the time is that being in Baton Rouge, I was captured by that event, and I was obsessed for, I guess, about 10 weeks. So the hurricane hit in and around September 1st, and by November 5th, I had a draft of this, and I went and read. <laughs> 
Louisiana enslavement history, sugar versus cotton, uh, the, the river and the levees, uh, you know, hurricane formation. Were our hurricanes more uh, frequent in the Atlantic now because of uh, global climate change, or is there a natural cycle? So it's, a, it's an example of what I use a, as a case study, and I think there's even a sort of ontological notion there. This is a crystallization of a multi dimensional uh, uh, multiplicity that happened to concrete, uh, concretize itself as Hurricane Katrina. But it's vastly multidimensional because if you don't understand Louisiana racism, you can't understand the reaction of the government to that. The reason that FEMA, well, FEMA was a little later actually. The reason, though, there wasn't an official government response till Friday was that the initial first two days was a, a, a local citizen response. People were getting in their boats and throwing them out. And a variety of racially tinged uh, uh, rumors of uh, people shooting at helicopters and so on and so forth caused the government to shut it down. So from Wednesday to Thursday, the local people of Louisiana were forbidden from entering New Orleans until they could bring the National Guard in on Friday. So this, this is probably on a Thursday waiting outside the uh, uh, Superdome for the uh, tanks to show up. I think I've got a picture somewhere, on, somewhere else on the, on the web. All right, so the real thing is what fits in with Mark is uh, a little bit on Deleuze and biology, and I'm especially looking at the uh, work of Mary Jane West Eberhardt, who is um, working in uh, El Salvador. Uh, she is uh, a great, great biologist. And this book is from 2003, and it's part of what people now talk about as a, as a, uh, a new synthesis. They don't want to replace the modern uh, Darwinian, uh, uh, Darwin, Mendel, and DNA synthesis, but they want to expand it. So one of the biggest people involved in that expansion is uh, Susan Oyama, and uh, so people gathered around her, are called developmental systems theory. People gathered around uh, West Everhart, what she calls her work is uh, eco, devo, evo. Right. So she puts the emphasis on ecological change, driving developmental change, then driving genetic change. So her slogan is that genes are followers of developmental experimentation, right. induced by environmental change. She allows for mutation, which is the standard way of thinking about uh, generating uh, variation for selection, but she wants to expand it. So we all, many people know the term evo-devo, that has to do with uh, uh, Hox genes and lots of uh, famous stuff that came out in the early, uh, early part of the 2000s, and Sean Powell was a great book. Uh, but she wants to flip it around and uh, use the term uh, eco devo evo. Now to understand that, we have to do a real quick little primer. Huh? It used to be thought that you had the DNA, which is a linear strain of uh, nucleic acids, and they would be uh, brought down to the ribosome and you would produce a protein. So the slogan was, DNA makes proteins, proteins make us. So some, some, sometimes called the central dog on molecular biology. Molecular biology itself has moved on from that so that a reasonable, still a layman's simplification, because that's all, the only thing I can handle, but shows a number of intermediary processes. Right? So we have the linear uh, strands of DNA, of the um, nucleic acids. But they're brought down by various transcription factors, which are themselves open to the, 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 the information coming from cell position in uh, embryology, such that you're going to slice out what's, what are called introns, which do not actually get expressed. And you're going to pull out the exons, which comes from uh, expressive DNA. And then you're going to splice them together. Now, the interesting thing is that there are multiple ways of slicing and editing. So by the time you get down here to the ribosome, 
you have other uh, RNA molecules that will take this transcript. Right? So this is transcription. They'll take the transcript and add on an amino acid to produce your protein. And it's not finished yet because different proteins can themselves be sensitive to the needs of the cell condition at any one time, and they'll twist themselves around. So you've gone from the central dogma where you have one uh, 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 continuous string of uh, nucleic acids brought down to the ribosome, translated into a protein, and the protein goes to work. Now we have a whole field of multiple potentials right, in the DNA strain, uh, uh, strands that have to go through a, 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 a variety of optional uh, processes before you get down here, the so-called mature transfer of DRNA uh, strand, which then forms the proteins, and the proteins themselves can be responsible and flexible. So we've got this huge, what I would call a virtual field, for uh, um, uh, optional development. So these are our terms, uh, again using uh, difference of repetition, but we have a differential elements, genes are only uh, uh, defined in relation to other genes, but they do have a certain modularity as well. So they're not they're not locked into uh, 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 any uh, necessary uh, transcri uh, transcriptions or translations. And uh, okay, so we've got that. And then the uh, organisms themselves end up as uh, uh, parts of assemblages, although we can certainly talk about our own organism or any organism as itself in the center. So one of my slogans I, I like to say is that we are biosocial all the way down and all the way back, who's one of the great greatest of the 20th century biologists, Lynn Margulis, talks about what she calls serial endosymbiosis theory. And the most famous example of that is the capture of the mitochondria, which had been previously independently existing uh, uh, bacterium swallowed up and to produce uh, the uh, uh, nuclear, the, the uh, eukaryotic cell. So there's been uh, uh, parasitism, it's a difficult thing to say, right? Or the mitochondria, we always talk about them as the factories of the cell. Are they though, captured and enslaved and put to work? There's a lot of political metaphors being used in, in biology, so. A lot of stuff to talk about. Uh, okay, so the uh, key point here is uh, the functional gene, which is the mature tRNA, transfer RNA transcript, brought down to the ribosome for the construction of the proteins, is constructed according to the needs of the cell and the developing organism. That's uh, West Edward Hortz, okay? Such that if you look back up to the linear strand of DNA, you cannot predict in advance what is potential in there. It has to be brought out by these experimentations. Once it's brought out, you can say, well, aha, it had to have been potential, but you cannot predict. That's the claim that West Edward says. Now, what happens is that eventually, through natural selection, you can get a locked-in DNA strand following the selection pressures on these developmentally plastic phenotypes. So that's really the point. It's not Lamarckian, she insists. So what Lamarck would say is that the developmental changes or the uh, 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 movements, the intensive processes of the organism will change the hereditary variation. She denies that. She says that the hereditary variation is pre-existing. But it's pre-existing in this complicated and uh, uh, um, uh, virtual form. Right? So you, you don't, you can only figure out that it's there after having gone through this experimentation. So there's a great little quote here from Evelyn Fox Keller, and she uses this musical metaphor. So it's like a jazz improvisation rather than an orchestra following your Uh, and so she says, the problem for biologists, but the interesting thing for us philosophers, 
is that the music inscribed in the score does not exist until it is played, and it's being rewritten as it's being played. So that trick I like to graft onto a Deleuzian concept called counter-actualization. The great fear that uh, Deleuze had to always fight against is the idea that the virtual, populated by, again, they have different terminology, abstract machines, or ideas, or multiplicity, <coughs> pre-exists in its already structured form. That's, pl that's Platonism. And he can't accept that. Right? So what he, we have to do is talk about the way in which these intensive processes for actualizing multiplicities feed back up into the virtual realm, changing those multiplicities and, and uh, structures or patterns or whatever you want to call them for future development. And that's the... Um, that's the whole ball of wax there. Uh, so, move a little quickly since I'm going to give uh, Manuel time. We started uh, one hour and ten minutes ago. So, uh, anyway, so eco devo evo, talk about that. Uh, so, what, what West of our claims is that organisms have a certain developmental plasticity, such that the famous example. I'll move I'll quick to that. So it's not one walking. The example is the two-legged goat. So this poor thing had something wrong with it. We don't know whether it was a mutation or a trauma or issues in the uterine, something or other. But it lived to adulthood by completely refixing, right? It's hip and glutes and uh, uh, shoulder ligaments, right? In order to get going. Evolutionarily then, human beings are two-legged apes. So the development of her claim would be human beings didn't become bipedal by waiting for genetic mutation. Not we became bipedal by getting up on our haunches, but playing back onto the plasticity and the pre-existing but unexpressed genetic variation of our primate minds. We would do that. So then after a while then, selection pressures allow for a fixing of the gene code for bipedals. But there had to be, and if we had more time, maybe we could work it out. There had to be analogous to the domestication of maize, one of the most interesting new uh, fields of, of theses in uh, anthropology now is called the human self-domestication thesis. So part of it has to do with the transition from uh, uh, finding the last common ancestor between chimps, bonobos, and humans, or homo, uh, 